Yeah, very good. Sorry for the wait. Uh, I'm uh, Geoffrey Kahn from Cambridge in England, and I'm very delighted to be with you here today. And thank you all for coming. Uh, and so I thank you for. What's your name? Yuda. Yuda. Thank you very much, Yuda, for your computer. <laughs> it's half your half your lecture. <laughs> it wouldn't be it wouldn't be for you. We wouldn't have this because I've prepared a PowerPoint. Uh, uh, for, to, for the next three days I'll be to giving a series of three lectures on Neo-Aramaic now we'll see how we get on uh, I've prepared a lot of slides but I'm going to uh, uh, I probably won't show you all of these but what I want to do is broadly speaking I want to give you a, a, a general introduction to Neo-Aramaic its background uh, this lesson together with some remarks about phonology <coughs> And then tomorrow I want to talk about morphology and on, then on uh, Wednesday about syntax. So rather than sit down and learn or together one particular dialect, I want to give you an overview of some of the, what I think are the fascinating linguistic developments in Neo-Aramaic. So first of all, let me uh, tell you how... Uh, scholars normally uh, ca uh, classify Neo-Aramaic. Neo-Aramaic uh, are spoken forms of Aramaic and, and I know a lot of you are doing uh, some of the more ancient forms of Aramaic in various other courses here uh, at the summer school. Uh, but Neo-Aramaic dialects are, are, the, are the surviving spoken forms of, of earlier Aramaic. Now, they're normally divided into uh, three uh, into sorry into four major subgroups: Central Neo-Aramaic, Northeastern Neo-Aramaic, which is usually abbreviated to N-E-N-A, which we call in English Nina, mm -hmm. and then Neo-Mandaic and Western Neo-Aramaic, and they are uh, located in various parts of the Middle East. The Central Neo-Aramaic is spoken here up in the area of, of, of Tur Abdin uh, near the town of um, Mardin in southeastern Turkey that is west of the Tigris River that consists of a, a, a group of very closely related dialects normally referred to as Turoyo um, and, and, and another dialect which was spoken slightly further north called Malahso then we have towards the east of the Tigris River we have a very very diverse group of, uh, of, of Neo-Aramaic dialects co called Nina, northeastern Neo-Aramaic and this is where the Nina dialects are spoken they were spoken by Christians and Jews uh, in northern Iraq, north, southeastern Turkey and various parts of western Iraq uh, then t in the S southwest of Iran we have a small number of Neo-Mandaic dialects spoken by the Mandaeans and then in three villages near Damascus we, there, are, uh, uh, there, there, there are three villages near Damascus called Ma'alula, Jabar and Bakhadin uh, which, um, uh, in which they speak Western Neo-Aramaic now all of these dialects um, have some relationship to more ancient Aramaic but sometimes the relationship is, is not direct and this applies in particular to the dialects in this area in the central Near Aramaic and northeastern Near Aramaic which are not clearly direct descendants of some of the eastern uh, Aramaic dialects such as Syriac or Jewish Babylonian Aramaic um, now, I'm, I should say, by the way, that most of these Neo-Aramaic dialects now are in a state of endangerment. That is to say, they are uh, some of them, in fact, have become extinct already since over the last hundred years, and many are now in a state of endangerment. And that, that is to say, they're in, they're in danger of extinction. This applies, for example, to many of the northeastern Neo-Aramaic dialects. Uh, the Jews and Christians spoke very different dialects there, there's an interesting phenomenon of what we call communal dialectal split that is to say even Jews and Christians living in the same area, the same town would speak very different dialects um, and 
the, all the Jews left, Aramaic speaking Jews left the region in the 1950s and moved, most of them moved to the state of Israel um, and now they are, they are only very elderly speakers of the Jewish Aramaic dialects and they are therefore particularly in danger, in danger of extinction and then of course with all the various disturbances in the Middle East since really, since the First World War for the last hundred years many of the Christian communities have been moving out of the region uh, and in fact even in recent years in recent years, the last three or four years with the troubles in Syria and in, and in Iraq we've had more displacements of Aramaic speaking communities um, so um, but let me um, I'm going to concentrate in most in, in these talks mainly on northeastern Niaramek, that is Nina because Nina is the, is the group which I've done most work on and this is the, a, a map showing you some of the places where Nina dialects were spoken. Now of course when I'm talking about the map of Nina really I'm talking about really what the state of, of Nina at the beginning of the 20th century before the First World War because things changed vastly for the reasons I've just described uh, but we, these are some of the place names and we'll be referring to some of the dialects in some of these places in the course of the talks. Uh, the main point to note is that it's the Tigris River which is the main dividing line between Nina and central Nia Aramaic. Uh, that is a, one of the, 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 these are the, really the only two surviving subgroups of Nia Aramaic which are essentially adjacent to each other but they are split by the Tigris River which um, now the Tigris River uh, rivers often do divide dialect groups uh, but it's, it's important to note that the reason that a river can be a boundary between dialect groups is not because you can't cross a river it's not so, so difficult to cross a river but it, it's, bec it's often because the river has been in earlier history a boundary between different empires or different forms, uh, different churches in this case. For example, the Tigris was a boundary be between the Eastern Roman and Persian empires in late antiquity and also a boundary between Syrian Orthodoxy of Turabdin and the Nestorian church of the ex sasanian land. So I think one could say that the dialectal split between Central Near Aramaic and Nina does reflect these earlier divisions, political and ecclesiastical divisions early in history. And these divisions are quite radical, as we'll see. Uh, one of the distinctive features, for example, of, Turab, of, the, of the dialects of Turab Din, Turoyo, uh, is the fact that a original long A vowel is pronounced as an O, which is a feature, of course, of Western Syriac and also Neo-Aramaic dialects, Western Neo-Aramaic dialects, so that if you met somebody from Turabdin, you say Shlomo. But if you met somebody from the Nina-speaking area, you say Shlama, uh, because there's a different historical phonology of, of, of the long vowels. In actual fact, in, on the borderlands on the far western periphery in the Bortan area of the Nina dialect area, for example, up here, if you met somebody in that region, he would say to you, Shloma, in a sort of a hybrid form. In actual fact, that has a rather different historical phonology from Shlomo, but the point being is that there is a tendency to round stressed vowels in, in the Bhutan region. So that can be regarded as a kind of a transitional feature. Because at the boundary of dialect groups, one often does get we have this phenomenon of transitional features in that you often get a uh, sort of features which belong to one dialect group and, and also the other. Now, um, now I want to run through quite quickly some of the subdivisions uh, within Nina because Nina is incredibly diverse group. It consists of, I estimate, somewhere around 150 dialects uh, not, but, uh, only a small number of which have been properly documented. Uh, the, its, its diversity itself reflects great antiquity. 
because when you have a great cl a cluster of very diverse dialects it shows that they, they must have had a many many centuries of this diversity and in fact uh, it, it, it does seem that the Nina dialects and this would apply also to the other spoken Neo-Aramaic dialects but certainly in the case of the Nina dialects is they, they are the descendants of an ancient vernacular form of Aramaic which was spoken in late antiquity and in fact one fascinating thing about Nina dialects is that you can find a number of Akkadian words inside the dialects particularly <coughs> relating to agriculture traditional ways of life which have survived in the spoken dialects and that must indicate that really they were vernaculars in antiquity and we have we, we must have they must reflect a contact between Akkadian and spoken Aramaic in antiquity and these have survived um, so the now, but so among this diversity, one can draw certain, um, make certain classification. And uh, if we take various parts of the one by one, if we start with Iraq, then we will we'll divide, first of all, the dialects. Uh, in all regions, <coughs> the dialects should be split between the uh, classified into Christian and, and Jewish dialects, because there's, very di there's great differences between the two. Now, in Iraq, the Jewish dialects themselves have a very clear. So it can be divided into two very clear groups. We have the, so, the, the dialects, so-called Ishana Daini dialects. The, these are dialects which use this particular expression to say our language. Uh, and this, this, this is a, a group of dialects north, spoken north of the Zab River. And we just quickly go back to see the Zab, and I forgot a map, um, that the Zab River is uh, this river here. Now, those dialects north of that Zab, like Zacho, Amedia, Dohuk, the Jewish dialects, they're very different from the Jewish dialects over the Zab River, uh, Arbel, Vandas, Rustaka, Sulamania, and all the, dialects, all the Jewish dialects in Western Iran, like, like Sanandar, Kerend, we haven't got Kerend, yeah, Kerend down here, all of those are, uh, have a very, very different structure. And uh, this... Uh, these are normally referred to as trans-Zab dialects. This is a term coined by my uh, friend and colleague uh, Hezi Mutsafi uh, from Tel Aviv. Uh, the, the, these are known as trans-Zab dialects. Now, uh, the reason, again, a river is not normally, uh, I say, a, ri a, a physical boundary of a river is not the explanation for these big change, these differences. In this case, it, it seems that the, the difference is because of a differences in substrate languages because as we're going to see perhaps I'll, I'll move ahead to that uh, um, I want to uh, yeah perhaps I won't go ahead too far because we're gonna, I'm going to but um, yeah um, the um, the, the point is that the, in that area to south of the Zab uh, um, there, was, there was historically a different substrate language for, for the Aramaic dialects from those Aramaic dialects north of Zab now north of the Zab the, the, one of the main substrate languages the, the languages of contact over the last many centuries has been a, a dialect a form of northern Kurdish called Kurmanji whereas south of uh, the Zab there's a different contact lang la language um, which today is a, a, a kind of Kurdish known as Central Kurdish or Sorani Kurdish but before that there was another language uh, Iranian language called Gorani and that it seems is the language which really did um, was in many centuries of historical contact with these trans Zab dialects and that the boundary between these, these different Iranian languages was the Zab River so in fact that is really the probably the explanation so you can see that dialect divisions can have explanations other than simply geographical features it's, um, now we also have a very small cluster of uh, dialects, uh, Jewish dialects e uh, sort of a transitional dialects in between the um, <coughs> these two uh, these two I'll go back to the map because I think it's going to make it easier here yeah. up in this region there's a little a few surviving groups of 
dialects, uh, Jewish dialects, uh, t- which exhibit transitional features, the, the area of Barzan, it's known as. Now, the Christian dialects are um, divided. I'll, I'll keep this, this map perhaps here, but rather than going through these, this list, because it'll mean, I think it'll mean more to you with the map here. But the Christian dialects are. There's not such a clear division in the Christian dialects of Iraq, but there is. One can identify a number of areas where, uh, of distinct areas. One area is that are the dialects of the Mosul Plain. Uh, Mosul is located somewhere here. Dialects such as Karakosh, for example, uh, and the many Al Kosh. They're not all on the map here, but in this sort of area, we have a very distinct group of dialects and then up, then we start having another group in this area up to the Zab River in the sort of this area of Ahmadiyya and there's a, there's a place called Barwa which I've worked on a lot up here um, now so we've got the Mosul Plain we've got the area in just north of the Zab near the Turkish border that's um, a quite distinct then we've got Christian dialects east of the Zab are another have another uh, distinct uh, sort of form another distinct group. Uh, in this case, ex- the explanation for the differences again have, has various uh, various factors. One of them again is, is contact languages. It does seem that the contact of the languages, the, 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 the Mosul Plain dialects they were in particular in greater contact with Arabic dialects whereas in this region there was a greater contact with Kurmanji Kurdish and of course in this region it is central or Kurdish or Gorani again which has an effect on the, uh, the, 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 the dialects, Christian dialects spoken, spoken further east um, and uh, I think for the sake of time I'll just stick this map and go through some of the other areas it, up in southeastern Turkey, there are very, I mean, I'm talking about beginning of the 20th century before the Jews moved, there are very few Jewish dialects, in fact, historically there were, I should say, very few Jewish dialects. We had a few, there were a few here on the Turkish Iranian border, places like Gawar, and a few just over the border. But of course, this boundary with between Iraq and Turkey is, is a, quite a recent political boundary. Uh, but I'm, I'm only using the current political forms here, uh, with political um, term, uh, sort of borders. But essentially, most of the dialects in southeastern Turkey, the Nina dialect, which was spoken up to Lake Van and across to the the far eastern border of Turkey, most of the dialects were Christian and they were can be divided into various subgroups uh, very broadly speaking the Botan group uh, well there's various clusters there's probably about half a dozen clusters uh, but they are essentially there's a group around the Judy mountain area just right on the, just over the border from Zako, then there's the Botan region including what I marked as Botan and Hertavin that's a sort of another cluster. Then Van, there's a cluster of dialects in Van. Then in the center here, in the, what's known as the Hakari Mountains, there's a very dense cluster, there was, I should say, a very dense cluster of villages where we had the, what was called the Tiari dialect. <coughs> and that is a very, very dense cluster of dialects. And in fact, it is among all the Nina dialects, the Tiari dialects are some of the most most archaic they, 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 uh, they exhibit some of the most archaic features and one of the reasons for that is that they're so, they have su- they had such population density um, because languages change through contact with other languages but if you have a very very dense population that they, this often can prevent uh, rapid change or can, can be a, a conservative feature and then if you go further east we've got another cluster of, around the so-called Baz area, Baz and Jilu, these are sort of tribes of, us, of Christians. And then finally, over the border into Iran we have a, another cluster known as the Urmi cluster. We have Urmi, is a very, um, has a very big population on, on Urmi in northwest Iran and the Urmi plain. 
which spoke a dialect which became a literary form of Aramaic as well. It was, it was written down by missionaries in the 19th century and to this day it still acts as a, a kind of literary form of the Aramaic. Uh, and then we have related dialects that's related to Urmi in, uh, in, in further north in Salama. We have that Christian cluster. Uh, now, there we have one in further down in western Iran Virtually all of the Nina dialects we know about until uh, you know, in, in modern times, really from this area, Shino, Soldus, all the way down, Bokan, Sakas, all of those were spoke all, all of those were Jewish dialects. And in fact there's a big group all, all the way from Bokan essentially, Sakas, Sanandaj, Keren, that big group of Jewish dialects is a very uniform group, group of dialects, although quite of a, la a very large geographical area and because it's so uniform it shows you it's not so and not so ancient as the dialects in this area which are far more diverse and diversity shows antiquity so we can say that these, this really is the heartland of Nina the historical heartland and Iran is the sort of the periphery and uh, this is with, due to further migrations east and the, and the, the, the Aramaic speaking communities of the Jews really got as far east as Bijar Bijar is one of the most easterly communities of Aramaic speakers there are uh, there was until the middle of the 20th century a small community of Christians in Sanandaj but their dialect is very very close to the, the Christian dialect of Sulaymaniyya so that, that was due to migration it seems in, in recent history. Okay, now that is rather rapid overview of some of the classifications. And I, I say I think I, I, I was speaking to a map there rather than going through all these lists here. Uh, I um, I would say that uh, what I've, the picture I've just painted is now no longer there. I mean, really, the, in 1915, all the communities in southeastern Turkey were essentially driven out from their homes or massacred at least one half uh, something like 150,000 of the Christians in this region were, were massacred or lost their lives for various reasons in events which are connected with the Armenian Holocaust as well uh, and they're, they're in Turkey today there are, there are no Aramaic speaking Christians east of the Tigris um, Okay, and that, uh, 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 these maps are done. That's, by the way, just uh, they just give show the density of the Tiari villages. The, this is Tiari, and you can see how dense the, 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 the population was. Um, right now, because of the in, the fact that we we uh, now in, we're living in a time when these Neo-Aramaic dialects are so endangered, uh, it is very important that researchers document them while they're still spoken uh, and so I'm uh, this is a, just a picture of me uh, documenting them I, I, I'm not the only person doing, doing the documentation we have uh, Professor Fassberg in the background here uh, who is uh, in the back of the class I should say not in the background <laughs> who's also done a lot of very important documentation um, and uh, the uh, the, the point is that uh, they, they, we, we need more people to work on documentation therefore I'm very delighted that a lot of students here are taking an interest in this subject and I hope I can encourage you to continue. If we can get some sound I can show you, perhaps give you a bit of sound of, um, we can listen to a little bit um, yeah. you might yeah. I don't think you probably hear much of that, but uh, yeah. <coughs> All right, yeah, we'll get it a little bit hard, like that. But I can see we're not going to hear the audio very well. But I just want to—it's. It, um, I'll try and play this one. Actually, this, this, this. Well, this next one. Yeah. 
آنتار بزبی اتفال خدان خد آخد دو خبرون اتفال سوژه the point is this man those two pictures the first picture was of me in the village of Panda in uh, in Georgia there I mean after the if you like the events of of, of the 20th century and even before in fact in the, the 19th century many of the Christians moved into the Caucasus and there is a community in Panda in Tbilisi that was me doing field work there and this woman is uh, speaking they, her ancestors came from the Urmi region and she's speaking a, a dialect of Urmi and this man here he came from the far east of Turkey uh, in um, a place called Sarai uh, and he seems to be one of the final speakers of this dialect and in fact, I, I found him in Armenia uh, and he, he died uh, earlier this year so it's uh, he, this, is, this is one of the very unfortunate cases of the, one of the final speakers dying uh, and here we have just to give you some example of the differences between the uh, Christian and Jewish dialects here for example in the, in the, in the town of Urmi there were Jew Christians and the, there were Jews but they spoke very different dialects um, for example just a we can show you some basic constructions in phonology and also morphology we have very di different for, uh, uh, kind of features for example we have uh, uh, Christians would say Bela for house but the Jews would say Bela which shows a difference in historical phonology and also stress position uh, Christians would say Sura for small Jews would say Zora a, the Christians would say Tuyura for the mountain the, the, uh, the Jews would say Tura uh, and perhaps we won't go through all of these but we have also um, construction, different morphology we have different lexicon for example the Christians would say Hamzumile that means he is speaking uh, this is a loan through, from Kurdish whereas the Jews would say Maroe which ultimately goes back it seems to Hakka in Arabic uh, and Biswaila uh, means he is coming down in, in uh, Urmi but Kwashe is how you say he is coming down if, if, in the Jewish dialect so you can see a very different uh, uh, forms of, um, of dialect there now as I say a lot of changes in Nina have, have taken place due to contact with other languages um, and uh, the, the Nina dialects, as I said, have been in the region for many centuries, and they were really some of the oldest languages, among the surviving languages in the area, these are, they are some of the oldest. But there are many other languages in this part of, of Western Asia, which have been in contact, or are currently in contact with Nina dialects, Even the main ones being Kurdish in Iranian <laughs> language and Armenian. Armenian, of course, is a very ancient, has been in that region for the same amount of time Kurdish has been there for many centuries but, but it seems it's not as old as, uh, as as the Nina dialect then we've got contact with Arabic Arabic meaning various sorts of dialectal forms of Arabic particularly the so-called Kultu dialects of Arabic <coughs> these are dialects which are pe peculiar to Mesopotamia and northern Iraq then various forms of Turkic uh, uh, but these again are, are Azari in the Far East is particular but th these are recent arrivals you know really only, only the last few centuries have been in contact with Nina then Persian which has been in contact with the Western sorry the Eastern Nina dialects as a sort of an official language um, so uh, I want to now uh, go th start to go through some of the features which, uh, which are characteristic of the Nina dialects and, and say something about how they came about and essentially I'm going to look at conservative features and uh, innovative features uh, com com when we compare this with earlier Aramaic because I know a lot of you have worked on earlier Aramaic and you'll be familiar with the, the sort of the, the forms or phenomena in earlier Aramaic and I, I want to sort of spend a bit of time looking at how these have developed 
in the Nina dialect in particular, because uh, the, the developments in Nina dialects are all things which I have been personally working on a lot over the last few years. Now, first of all, let's look at the phenomenon of the so-called Bogadka fact consonants. Now, as I say, this first talk will be mainly about phonology. Um, I all know what Bogadka fact consonants are, I'm assuming. These are the series of, of consonants which in early Aramaic and Northwest Semitic and in Hebrew uh, become fricatives when preceded by a vowel. That's the normal rule. So you have a, what's known as a lenition of the letter or the consonant when preceded by a vowel. So in other words, the b, g, d, k, p, t become fricatives uh, which can have various forms, but traditionally they are in, in earlier forms of Aramaic or in Hebrew they are they are pronounced v r v ch f th. Uh, that is to say, that is to say is it what we call a lenition, a, a weakening of the articulation, because of a preceding vowel. So in earlier forms of Aramaic, they are what are known as allophones. In other words, they are variants of of the sound which are conditioned by a particular phonetic context. So. Um, they are, have a so-called, in this case, the phonetic context is a preceding vowel. Now, already in Syriac, you can see examples of what we call a phonemicization of these allophonic variants. In other words, you're starting to get uh, the fricative versions of, the, of, of these consonants in cases where there is no preceding vowel. And that means that they are gradually turning into what we're known as referred to as independent phonemes. And this, this phenomenon of phonemicization of the Bogadka fat consonants is, is, has be reached uh, completion in the Nina dialects and also in the Turoyo uh, cluster of dialects. For example, and therefore you get what we refer to as minimal pairs where you can have exactly the same a word, two words which look exactly the same except for the feature of a stop or a fricative of one of the Bogatka <coughs> series and, they, and the stop and the fricative are the only elements in the words which distinguish <coughs> them and, uh, and, and, and mark them as being different words with different meanings so for example in Turoyo we get the pair Kitio and Kithio Kitio is, uh, is meaning he is Kithio, she comes in the Nina dialect of Ashitha, this Tiali dialect, you get forms like Tela, which is a fox, and Thela, she came. So we have this. So we would say, therefore, in the Nina dialects, that Th is an independent phoneme and T is an independent phoneme. Although historically, uh, they, this Th would have been a ver an allophonic variant of the T. The reason that these allophonic allophones turn into phonemes is that the phonetic context changed and in this case for example there was originally an initial vowel before that thela and that would have created the fricative but that, foul, that vowel fell away and therefore there's no conditioning context so the change came about by the change of conditioning context um, now uh, the, if we look now that's the issue of phonemicization, but let, now let's look at the, qual the actual f the, the pronunciation of these begat kafat consonants, the, the fricative ph phonemes now which are developed from the begat kafat. Let's look at how they developed in the various dialects. Now it, it so happens that Turoyo in this feature and also in a number of other features of phonology is quite conservative in that it's preserved essentially the, although they're phonemes, but it's preserved the phonetic shape, if you like, of the of the of the consonants yeah, very conservatively. Uh, the, for, for example, the word the, the, uh, the bet here is pronounced like a w. Now I have to say that you may be used to pronounce things this as a as a labial uh, uh, dental v but it, in Eastern Syriac already, in the recitation of Eastern Syriac, yeah, a, a, a bet after a vowel is pronounced like a w. So, uh, but, so this is a phenomenon in Turoi and also in Nina So you say taunol for straw from tabnar. 
But <coughs> in all other respects, we get what we'd expect in Syria. We get Ravala, we're turning to Ravalo, Bache, Boche, Ida, Ido, Kafna, Kafno, Klatha, Klotho. So everywhere you get a, 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 the, the fricative doesn't really change its, its phonetic shape much. I mean, although the bits become phonemicized, of course, some of the other vowels have changed, but that's that's quite conservative. Now, in the Nina dialect, uh, the situation is a bit more complicated because, first of all, you've got such a, such a massive group, diverse group of of of, of dialects. But essentially, we've got uh, a we should split the the Bagadka fat into certain groups. Now, the 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 but put and cut. Uh, are reasonably uniform across the Nina dialects, but it's the fricative variants, or the, the regional historical aloforms, the fricative forms of the Gatka fat, we'll call them, have essentially in, in most dialects turned into w, p, and ch, respectively, so that the, the, the bet would go to a w, so you have a word like sawa, grandfather, in uh, these, these are all from Karakosh, uh, from Sava originally, um, but and and the f has turned in all Nina dialects has actually become has be undergone fortition to a p. So which is which differs from from Toroyu. So kefa stone would turn into a uh, form like kipa in uh, Karakosh or kepa in many dialects, and a a calf has turned into a fricative ch, or in other words, it's remained a fricative ch. It uh, hasn't gone under change. So bake, he weeps in Karakosh. So uh, there are, uh, but there are in other forms, uh, uh, in the other Bagadkifat consonants, there are quite uh, there are a number of changes, and these do tend to differ across the Nina dialects. Now, one of the uh, what we call a shared innovation of Nina let us say, a, an innovation which is found in all Nina dialects, is this phenomenon of the fricative G shifting from a R all the way to a, <coughs> either a, a laryngeal A, glottal stop, or a zero, via, it seems, a, a, a initially developing into a pharyngeal, an ein. so a R went to a A, then to a A, then to zero. Now, so, uh, and the most Nina dialects, well, all Nina dialects basically exhibit either the up or the zero, with a few very exceptions of a few words with the ein still preserved. Uh, for example, and the those dialects which have the the, the glottal stop uh, are um, particularly that we could regard this as the more more archaizing, more conservative dialects. Now, Kalakosh is one such uh, archaizing dialect, and that's a dialect which is um, spoken on the Mosul Plain, on the, uh, on, uh, which has many other conservative features. Uh, so, a word like sh shraga, lamp, would come out, would be in Kalakosh, shra'a. Uh, Raresh, which means he wakes up, was, is pronounced Raesh. And parler, he divides his parler. Um, now, but in a uh, dialect such as Barwar, which is in the far, <coughs> it's in the far north near Ahmadiyya, the alif really has gone to a zero, uh, and <coughs> has resulted in uh, forms which, so when you get it falling in, uh, disappearing between two vowels, you'd use <coughs> a, a glide. So shraha turns into shraya, raish turns into raish, raish, um, and uh, etc. So I think it's probably, I don't need to go through the, all the other forms, these are just some various other dialects, but th this is really a, a shared innovation of Nina. Now, there are a few cases where the original Ein gets preserved. For example, the Jews of Ahmadiyya would say Laoya, me for inside, and the Jews of Khoisanjak would say Loa, for inside, for the Ein. And this is to be derived from Lagawaya, or something similar, uh, with a, a G. And the reason that the Ein is preserved seems to be because 
the, the word also underwent what's known as pharyngealization this is what this little dot and the L is supposed to represent that is to say it was pronounced emphatic ooh. so this was something like or something like that a kind of pharyngealized like, in, like Arabic oh, like, like the emphatics of Arabic and this preserved the ein because pharyngealization is, is, is closely associated with with the ein with the pharyngeal and therefore this was a, was a conservative factor which preserved the ein it, it would seem uh, ok now what about the th and the now there are a number of dialects where the th and the is preserved like karakosh khatha the sister from ahatha either uh, festival from Eda, also Barwa, Khatha, and Eda. Now, across the world's languages, interdentals are actually quite rare. I mean, there are typologists who, who, who look at all of the world's languages, or as many as they can, and look at typological tendencies. And it turns out that, in fact, it's, although we have lots of interdentals in, in English, uh, we don't. They are quite rare in languages, uh, 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 and so um, it, it's no surprise that the languages in contact with um, Nina, many of them don't have interdentals, um, except for Arabic. Uh, so, and in fact, it seems that the Arabic the existence of a lot of Arabic dialects on the Mosul area probably is the explanation why Karakosh has preserved it interdental and Barwa is part of a cluster of, of essentially it's, it's, it's really the, at the south of the Tiari cluster of dialects in, in southeastern Turkey which as I said was a very very dense group of dialects and I think that's possibly why uh, the, the, because of that population density there is a, a resistance to influence of contact, lens, uh, contact languages um, now but many of the Nina dialects in Iran have, uh, under, uh, uh, have the, the <coughs> certain that the interdentals have undergone change under the influence of contact, langu uh, contact languages. Uh, for example, Kurdish, uh, which is the main contact language in the area, does not have interdentals. Um, and the, these, these shifts in the various Nina dialects to eliminate the interdentals have resulted in, in various outcomes. One of the ways in which the interdentals are eliminated is to turn them into stops. So in certain dialects, they, for sister, instead of saying khatha, they say khata. And in some dialects, and, and, and in such dialects like this bidaro, which is in the north of Iraq, you'd say eda uh, for festival, not eda. Now in some dialects, the interdentals are eliminated by turning them into sibilants so in Peshabor they would say Khasa, the sister Eza, the festival um, now there are some dialects where you get interestingly across the, the unvoiced th and the voiced th you get two of those strategies being used both of them, one for the um, unvoiced and one for the voice for example in Christian the Sulamani would say Khasa but Eda um, now um, I mean, there's, there, in, there's some interesting typological tendencies also in terms of what, which, which gets replaced by which but I'll leave that uh, time <coughs> being now the, uh, in, in the upper part of the Tiara region the dialect known as Upper Tiari you have this interesting development of a, the, the preservation of the Th but in most in context, other than in the region of high vowels. So if you have a word like melitha, this turns into melisha. You get a, the development uh, of this, uh, uh, um, this, this, this sort of palato alveolar sh. Um, and you've got. Uh, uh, but, in, but this only affects the unvoiced th in a word like either, for example, that the interdental <coughs> is preserved. And also pathich, you have the, the interdental, the unvoiced interdental preserved because it's not following a high vowel. 
So, and but Bersha is the is the equivalent. Is what how they pronounce house in these dialects. This is after the diphthong bytha, and that you get the. It's really because of that high, uh, high offset of the of, of the uh, of the diphthong that you get this shift to a sh. Um, now, um, okay, and uh, you in the Jewish dialects you get the various outcomes. You get some which are very conservative, like the Jews of the Hock, but most have undergone some change. Uh, you get uh, many have, like Jewish Zacho have turned them into sibilants, Chasa, Iza, and many have various sort of different combinations, like Chasa, Ida in Nerwa, Chasa, Ida in Betanuri and, and Amadia, where uh, you have different outcomes. In fact, the, 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 the unvoiced one there is preserved, as you see. So each, you know, there are these many, many sort of variant sort of outcomes uh, in across the various dialects. Um, now, the uh, the trans Jewish dialects are very interesting. They exhibit this shift of interdentals to the lateral L. So you say, Mala is the word for Martha village, and Ila is the word for hand, either. Uh, this is a feature that you won't find much in current Sorani Kurdish, which is the main contact language in this area, uh, but it was more widespread in earlier forms of Iranian languages in the area, and that seems to have been the, uh, the, the explanation. And this shows, by the way, uh, that it's, it's num one of many examples of how the Nina dialects have undergone change through contact at a, at a much early historical period, and then the contact land language itself disappears or changes it in a different direction, and the Nina dialect preserves, the, if you like, the ancient, more ancient feature of the contact language, whereas the contact language has lost it. So uh, this is uh, one such feature. Um, Okay, uh, now, and then we've got in the Hakari Mountains, we have the, a complete loss of the unvoiced th in a number of dialects in the Baz and Jilu area. So, in Baz, some Baz villages, the word for Martha village, they would say Ma, Maha. Uh, and in Jilu, they'd even s simply say Ma or Martha, there would, there would be a, a reduction of the th to a h or zero, and that is a characteristic of the Baz and Jilu dialects. Uh, so Malkutha in Jilu would be pronounced Milkua, not Mil, that the th would be completely lost. Um, now, an interesting feature in many Nina dialects is this emergence of unaspirated stops. Now, uh, the point is that when aren't we talking about stops and fricatives, um, un, uh, and we're talking about unvoiced stops, in Nina, uh, an unvoiced stop, like a t uh, or a p, for example, in Nina, these are normally aspirated. So, in other words, there's a uh, what we call the voice onset time, it, w the time it, it takes for the voice to start after the after the release of the consonant. There's a gap uh, w in which there's a free flow of air. So if I exaggerate it, I say pa, <laughs> but before the in other words before the vowel begins, pa, for example. Now I, I believe in Russian, you your stops are unaspirated. Yes, correct. Yes. So like in English. Now the point is that. In Nina, as in Semitic, unvoiced stops are typically aspirated. So, uh, but uh, so when I've been talking about put and tough, for example, so far, or k, the uh, I'm talking about aspirated stops, and that is that is general throughout Nina. However, in Nina dialects, in the in the northern part of the Nina area, there there are you will find a, another series of unvoiced, unaspirated stops. So you have p and p, um, which is a Russian p, <laughs> basically. Uh, and t and, and d, which is a, again a Russian p. And then of course you have the voiced versions. So you have these triads, 
uh, in, in many Mina dialects. Now this triad is not uh, is a phenomenon which is not uh, um, uh, it, it, it developed through contact, and and, the, and the, uh, you'll find this. This, these triads, in other words, the existence of both of, of, of this three-way distinction, uh, also in Kurmanji dialects, uh, that is to say, northern Kurdish dialects spoken essentially in, in, in Turkey and the, and, the, and the northern part of Iraq. And the, the Nina dialects that have this feature are in exactly the same area. But the origin of this doesn't seem to be in Kurmanji, it does seem to be in Armenian. That's where it all began. Uh, in fact, uh, but because they're a very ancient feature of Armenian, and, and you, and this feature, <coughs> the, the, the these, this is the sort of the, 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 the system, if you like, of of the uh, unvoiced uh, uh, stops. And I've also 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 the so-called affricate uh, has developed. I'm not going to have much time to talk about affricate, the ch, but this is a, a k, and this is actually a palatal stop. It's a k, not k, k. Uh, but in Urmi, you have this unaspirated series, which I mark with this little sign, as well as the voice series. So you have p, b, and b, etc. And that corresponds exactly to what you get in Armenian. So the whole system of of, all, of the Christian Urmi dialect has somehow changed by by aligning itself to the system uh, of Armenian and Kurmanji Kurdish. Now you get. Um, in, a, uh, in a dialect as a Christian army you get unaspirated stops in loan words for example there are a number of Russian loan words in, uh, in Christian army and typically when you get a Russian loan word coming into Christian army which has a, a but or tut in it you would have an unaspirated stop so the word for a um, a pipe is truba you would say yes mm-hmm. you would say truba truba yeah, yeah okay uh, and uh uh, so, um, or the word for a, a, a coax is balto, yes, balto. yes, which is uh, that. There are actually some Ukrainian words in in, in, in uh, Christian or yes, There's um, the word for a towel, ruchnik. You say mm-hmm. yes, that, mm-hmm. that, that that is found in in Christian or I'm not sure how it got there. It may be in Ru- southern Russian dialects. As well. I, I don't know. How it got there, but okay. Leaving aside the loan words, how did the we also get unaspirated stops in native Nina words, native Aramaic words? So it's very interesting how they developed. Uh, the one of the ways it developed is that if you have a, a, a voice stop historically followed by a glottal stop, like in b ida by hand. The, the sequence of a voice stop plus a, 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 a if you like a glottal stop is some becomes reanalyzed as a glottalized labial. So but up uh, comes a but uh, because in a way a un, an unaspirated stop is, is 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 has its <laughs> has associations with with a glottal stop because essentially you'll stop the there's often a a, 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 a firmer closure of the glottis when you pronounce the th. And in fact, in certain, I have to say that in the dialects of variants of Urmi, which are spoken in the Caucasus today, like in Kanda, in, in Tbilisi area, that you often hear these unaspirated stops as, uh, as, as adjectives. So you say pa or ta with ta, we come ta. Which of course it does seem to be an influence of Georgian. Um, so another interesting way in which an aspirated stops develop is through the f- fact that there is a, a a a general phonetic phenomenon that if you have a an aspirated stop after a fricative, that is to say, a cluster of fricative plus aspirated stop, you would get uh, you by by a, a general feature of pronunciation, of articulation, that the stop uh, would be unaspirated. 
in actual fact what's going on is that the actual aspiration is somehow taken over by the fricative it's somehow incorporated in the fricative and this applies to English as well so we say king but we say skin and the k there after the fricative let's say that the sibilant fricative is unaspirated skin now what's happened is that therefore in a word <coughs> like bire he dug that p is unaspirated because of its phonetic environment but in most other Nina dialects, in Nina dialects without the unaspirated stop phoneme, you would say chbidre, which that p would be unaspirated. But if you wanted to turn it into a, a form like chapir, is from the same root, you would pronounce that as aspirated, chapir. But in Burmi, what's happened is many of these words, it, because speakers hear chbidre in a form after a fricative, they somehow analyse that as being a, that there must be an unaspirated phoneme there, and therefore what they, this becomes a general feature of the root, and they hear things like khafir and this, we can formalise this by saying that the an original phonetic variant after a, after a fricative becomes reanalyzed as a phonemic uh, sequence so there's somehow a, 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 a um, the reanalysis there again is a little bit like the began Kafat kind of story. We have phonemicization of an allophone, and in this case, the phonemicization has undertaken through through the availability of unaspirated uh, uh, unaspirated phonemes in languages in contact. And so um, now. Uh, and then another, finally, another interesting feature of these unaspirated stops is that they sometimes can get used by speakers for what's sometimes referred to as sound symbolism. That is to say, a, an unaspirated stop is, 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 is associated with a diminutive in many cases. Mm -hmm. uh, so, for example, small objects or, or verbs expressing small, uh, let us say, very gentle or uh, actions or sounds of, a, of low volume often have <coughs> innovative unaspirated stops. For example, eyelash is dilba, which, does, as far as we can see, comes from a word ta talife in Syriac, which is a, normally an aspirated stop. But there's no, the only, it seems the reason it's pronounced dilba in Urmi is because it's a kind of what it is through this sound symbolism to, to, sh to express its smallness so there's an interesting and there are a um, number of other, uh, other examples even, even with loan words Azari Pichul Damok is means to whisper but in Azari they don't have an aspirated stops but when it comes into, into Nina it's these stops and fricatives are, and, and affricates are made unaspirated it's a batch bitch and that is because it's a sort of symbolism of expressing the smallness of the or the, the quietness of, of the of the uh, of the uh, activity and it also can be used to express a kind of a emotional uh, n not diminutive but diminutive in a sort of to express endearment so the word for sh the r historical form Shapira with an aspirate stop comes out of Shapira uh, which uh, seems to be a form of expressing endearment. Also, very interestingly, the feminine form of small <coughs> has an unaspirated stop in it in the spoken language. So you say sutta, sutta. And that's undergone two shifts for sound symbolism. First of all, the T has become unaspirated, and also the Z, which was originally from Zaora in Aramaic, has become devoiced. Both are features of sound symbolism and both are designed to express smallness. Now this can be contrasted with jolto, the word the feminine of big, which has not, not got the, the, the it has, a, has, an, has an aspirated stop. Um, okay, now let's move on to, oh, that's just to show that the, sort of the language system here has a basically, it's probably a lot of time to go into all the details, but basically trying to, I'm trying to show you that the Urmi system has developed by aligning itself with essentially the Armenian system in particular. So uh, uh, now let's let's try and let's go on to talk about pharyngeals.
Baron Dill, you know, we're talking about Ains and ha Haz in Arabic. These, of course, existed in early Aramaic, in Het and Ain. Uh, they have been preserved in Turoyo, uh, intact. Um, this is probably due to the conservative uh, effect of Arabic, this is what Otto Yastro has explained it as, and, uh, and it's, the fact is that Turoyo historically has been exposed to Arabic more than other, more than the Nina dialects. Um, now, in Nina, most, ca most we have various developments, but essentially the main development is that the ha, <coughs> the unvoiced uh, pharyngeal, has turned into a ch, a vila fricative. So you say, original hmara, donkey comes out as hmara, uh, and the um, this again is presumably to be explained through issues of language contact because pharyngeals are, are not a feature of other languages in the area. There are some to be found in Kurdish, but they seem to have probably got into Kurdish through contact with Arabic. Um, and uh, there are a few dialects in the Botan area where you actually have a ha, you say hmara, uh, and this possibly can be regarded as one of these transitional features. Uh, and in fact these dialects even pronounce a ch as a ha, so bahe is historically from bahe, and they say, in Herzabi they say bahe, um, which um, is not what you get in Toroy, or you, get, you have the ch preserved. Now the ayn is, uh, as is the case with the rain, it, it develops into a laryngeal a uh, or, a, or a zero. So you have things like in, uh, in Tiare, when you look to say mar'a from mar'a, be'e from for be'e, x, and in some dialects, like Urmi, it's completely disappeared, so mar'a turned to mar'a, and be'e turned into be'e. Um, now, uh, the by the way, I mean what we saw in the rain, the development of rain to ein to to aleph to zero, that intermediate stage of ein, which is still preserved in a few environments like loa in uh, Jewish Koisenjak, for example, uh, is of course the development that happened in earlier Northwest Semitic of of a original vela fricative turning into ein, so raza went to azza. So we have this, another phenomenon of, of, of Niyar makers, often you have <coughs> recyclings of, of phonetic, di of phon phonological change, uh, which same kinds of developments has occurred in earlier forms of, 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 of Aramaic. Now, uh, the ein is preserved in a few cases uh, in Nina dialects, particularly in Iraq, uh, where, and this is ex occurs specifically uh, where in the, wo in the word there is an emphatic consonant, a pharyngealized consonant. Um, for example, in Karakosh there was say ta'an, ta'an, which from ta'an he lifts, or mahoka from rahoka. Now, the point is, in this word you have a ta, an emphatic t, in this word you have a ka, a, 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 a cough, which is part of the so-called emphatic series of, 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 of letters that it has a pharyngealization. Um, and in some cases, like in the, in the Transab dialect, you get this ayn preserved even when the emphatic itself has become weakened. So you say things like titna, although there's no titna, there's no emphasis there on the t, the ayn is still preserved historically. Um, so, uh, now, now uh, let me say something about emphatic consonants now. Uh, I, now, in, in the dialects of Iraq, you tend to get a situation emphatics, you have a ta and a sot, and they, they behave essentially like Arabic emphatics, ta and sod. They are, they are pronounced with what's called pharyngealization. In other words, you, you pull your tongue, the back of your tongue, towards your, the, the upper pharynx, and creating an effect known as uh, uh, pharyngealization. So a tap goes to a top, and if, as you can hear, the result of this is also a lowering of the resonance of associated vowels, and particularly the a vowel going to o, and that's called pharyngealization. And this 
this effect, the so-called co-articulation, that is to say the fact that you get a, a vowels next to it, next to these emphatics, undergoing this lowering of resonance, that, that, that spreading of emphasis, which is called, uh, in the dialect of Iraq, typically does not spread across the whole word. It, as in Arabic, it tends to be spread across one syllable, or sometimes two, but typically not the whole word. Now, but if you go into further <laughs> to the east, in the in particularly the Ormi Plain, you get a phenomenon that emphasis of pharyngealization is no longer a phenomenon of a single consonant, which historically it was. I mean, the Iraqi dialects are more conservative. In the Ormi Plain, the emphatics are now, the, the, if you like, the pharyngealization has become reanalyzed as not a feature of the consonant, but a feature of the whole word. So a word like tamir, he buries, in a dialect like, I don't know, Barwa Karakosh, you would say tamir, and in Urmi you'd say tamir, same. This, it would phonetically be the same. But the actual phonological analysis would be different. In Karakosh, for example, that tami, the top, would be an in, in, would be simply the so-called pharyngeal or pharyngeal I've written here feature would be part of the top. It would be a we can perhaps we can don't have to go into all the phonetic details here, but basically this pharyngeal feature would be a a feature of this consonant, the segment, the top. Mm -hmm. But what happened in Ormi is that that pharyngeal somehow goes up into the level of the word. Uh, and it becomes, it means that, and this by the way, the typically in Arabic and in da, Nina Daleks of Iraq, an emphatic top is not only pharyngealized, but it's also unaspirated, that's the point uh, I should make. Uh, and what happens is therefore, I'm saying tense, which means unaspirated basically here. So that firing, a shift occurs whereby that pharyngeal feature goes into the level of the word and this T therefore is simply analysed as an unaspirated T which, uh, top, which, which as, you, as I explained exists in this dialect as part of the phonological system. So, and so the result is that this father should be analysed as a, an unaspirated T and this cross means that the feature of emphasis or pharyng pharyngealization is a feature of the whole word. And this development has been, uh, as most developments in Nina, has been, has been induced by language contact. And uh, essentially there are two factors here. One is the existence in the, in the environment, uh, in particularly you know, Armenian and Kurdish dialects, Kurmanji dialects, of unaspirated stops that facilitated the identification of that as, as part of that as that phoneme, the unaspirated stop and then the, uh, another factor was the existence in, in, in Turkic languages of a form of harmony uh, which affects typically vowels but also consonants um, in, in many Turkic languages uh, it's a quite a complicated story which I won't go into now because in fact the convergence with Turkish is in fact vowel harmony or, or harmony in fact is only partial it's not complete in the, in the, in the Christian Ormi dialect in the Jewish Ormi dialect a similar phenomenon develops except we have seems to have a greater convergence with Turkish uh, with the Turkish model of harmony uh, I mean very briefly the, the in, in Christian Ormi, you uh, this emphasis um, when you have a evangelization across the whole word. Uh, really, the only vowel that really c gets changed is the a vowel. So uh, you would have something like uh, something like uh, a difference between things like um, cholta and chalta which is Cholta is food, Chalta is, a, is, a, is an aunt mm -hmm. and uh, uh, a word like um, <coughs> so, but or the high vowels like or and who tend not to get affected so you say things like Torah which is an ox, Soma 
so the O, the A vowel will be affected, but the O on the O would remain the same. Now, in in Turkish, what happens is that the we have this the harmony between back pronunciation of of words of front pronunciation, and this affects all the vowels, including the O. So in, in Turkish, you have back O versus front E. Uh, you have a fronting of the round vowel. Now this phenomenon actually is found in the Jewish army. So in, in Jew the Jews of army would say tera for an ox, but palote with an o in the in the pharyngealized bearing. So you um, in that respect the, the Jewish dialect has undergone greater convergence with with, with, with with Turkey, which by the way is 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 often the phenomenon of Jewish dialects that they become far more. Uh, 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 c they converge far more with languages in contact. That applies also to the Jewish dialects of Western Iran as well. But certainly in Ulmi, you can see the Ulmi, Jewish Ulmi dialect has, has converged far more with, with the languages in contact. And then we have another interesting phenomenon of uh, in the Western Jews, the Jewish dialects of Western Iran, like Sun and Daj, you get a phenomenon that a uh, Emphasis or the pharyngealization of segments like tama uh, is uh, essentially lost. But um, what happens is that uh, if there's an ein historically in, in the word, the, the, the pharyngealization would, would be preserved only in the ein. Mm -hmm. So you'd say something like uh, you say. Uh, for example, uh, uh, the, you say Tom Ah, and then in Jewish Son and Daj you say Tam Ah, Tam Ah. There'd be no pharyngealization in the T, in the T, but the Ain would be would be preserved. Where in his, in a, another verb with a historically a final Ain like like Shema to hear, for example, the the Jews of Son and Daj, the, sorry, the Jews of Son and Daj would pronounce that something like. Uh, she hears would be shama. It wouldn't be shama because there's no emphatic. Uh, interestingly, sometimes you get phenomena like certain other letters, like an M, for example, a label often develops pharyngealization, as in Arabic, uh, M can become mo, uh, and that can create a pharyngealized form like tomani sar, 18. Historically, I should have put a little, I think, star here, but when the pharyngealization gets lost, sometimes that it's preserved in a non-etymological eye. So they say things like Um That's a non-etymological eye. It's not there historically, but it does. It somehow it is a sort of a, a fossil of the original pharyngealization. Mm -hmm. So in other words, you get the, you get a very a, almost a reverse process from what we saw in Christian Ormi. In Christian Ormi, you get a segmental feature becoming suprasegmental. And in this group of dialects, you get su suprasegmental feature becoming a segmental feature. In other words, the R becomes segmentalized in, in an ein. Um, and also, we get this um, you get forms like the word for, in Jewish Ormi, the, the word for town, which originally comes from the word, Arabic word for peace, Athra, which it seems was pronounced historically. With pharyngealization, othra, because of the r, probably othra. Now, the th, well, exceptionally, this word becomes an h becomes simply turns into a laryngeal in Jewish Ulmi. So the same ohra would be the word for a town. Now, this pharyngealization, which presumably existed in some earlier form of the of the word uh, in Jewish son and dad, it's lost, but it's preserved by turning the h. Into a pharyngeal, ahra. Now that h is not historically a pharyngeal, pharyngeal as, as, as you, you know. It, it was originally a th, then turned into a h. Um, this problem is a bit clearer. The word for thirsty, historically sahya, with an h and emphatic s, turns into sahya in Urmi, Jewish Urmi, but sihya in Jewish son and dad. In other words, the emphasis, the pharyngealization is lost in the original segment. But the original laryngeal is, is, is strengthened into a pharyngeal and it somehow absorbs the pharyngealization. Like I 
it's a kind of like absorbing the pharyngealization and that is be, uh, and segmentalizing it and that that is a, a very interesting feature um, now I, I see that time has been uh, is going by quite rapidly <laughs> so I'm going to probably just start to finish now uh, and uh, just uh, just quickly one other point about uh, if you go into the Jews of Salamas they, they do something quite interesting with their pharyngealization it turns the A vowels which as I said are the vowels which are particularly infected by pharyngealization like Jews of, of all we would say Raba they in such cases the Jews of Salamas which is further north they would no, have no pharyngealization but a, a vowels which were part of the of words which were originally pharyngealization simply changed their quality so they say roba or corsa harsa bang this was originally an emphatic s uh, the Jews of Salamis would say corsa uh, interestingly this affects only the stem of the word not, inf not the inflectional ending um, now I think <laughs> on my PowerPoint I had lots of lots of other phonetic features but I, I'm not going to have time to go through them now uh, but I hope I've given you a sort of taste of of you know the, some of the fascinating de historical developments you find in neo aramaic dialects and uh, I, uh, I shall continue talking about morphology and syntax the next two days uh, but uh, I, I just sort of conclude by saying these, some of these developments are, are, are important not only for the study of Semitic languages but also very important for a general study of language because many of these phenomena are really are, are quite unique in the world's languages or, or, or certainly very important for understanding the many general features of, of language typology. Good, thanks. Well, Thank you very much, you there for your computer. Are you coming tomorrow? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry I didn't bring my computer. I thought we could have a, uh, a computer. Yeah. Can I have a question? Yeah. Question. Oh, sorry, do I don't know. We haven't had left any time for questions. But, uh, uh, we can have you questions. You're talking more. about this yeah. uh, old uh, contact with Armenian. Mm. Uh, but do we have uh, lexical uh, loans from Armenia? Yeah, that's a mysterious point. point. There's very few lexical loans with Armenia. Um, though uh, there are some, but very few. Maybe this language has lost yeah. this. Uh, yeah, that's long quite a mystery. Uh, but in phonology in particular, and also in morphosyntax, there is a lot of convergence with, me, with Armenia. With Armenia. Yeah. So. Uh, or oh, syntax. And could this be Kurmanji rather than Armenian? I mean, the well, Kurmanji is clear. I think is the main contact lang mm -hmm. language at the moment, and it's also the main contact language historically over the last Since when? few hundred. Well, certainly over the last two or three centuries, perhaps. Though Armenian uh, certainly is in the Umi area, for example, that there's, there's, there's very close contact with Armenian. I mean, there's many Syrian Christians speaking. <coughs> the Nina dialects are married to Armenians for example, with very close social relations um, and we'll see tomorrow actually in talking about morphology and there's a lot of there's some aspects of morphosyntax which I think began in Armenian so um, well, it lo looks mysterious you know, this yes. business <laughs> of Armenian without loans, it's never yeah. happened, mm. more, more or less never happened right? Mm. Yes, no, it is, that is a it's incredible, almost yeah. incredible. Eh? Yeah. But uh, how would you account for this uh, shared innovations? Uh, for example, we have also shared innovations in uh, lexica. For example, in the word Bachta yeah. is uh, shared by Jewish yeah. and Christian uh, dialects. Uh, yeah. Is it is it common? Uh, for example, in the phonology, is it common drift or? Is it uh, the, uh, part of the? Uh, is it because of uh, they were uh, they, they developed uh, together? They were tightly related geographically. Yeah, I mean there must have been some kind of. Um, the, the, I mean there, there must have been some kind of discrete group. I think. I mean, 
some kind of nucleus of yeah, uh, uh, so. neuromay. Yeah, <coughs> that must have been this group. Although, of course, there was a whole kind of complicating issues of contact. Huh? Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you, Jeffrey. I, um, I was quite interested in this communal split, and in particular the, the, the influence, its influence on the stress. Uh, what is your estimation? How, how ancient is the difference between Jewish and Christian dialects in having the penultima and the ultima? Right. Now, uh, it does seem that although the Transab dialects have the final stress, it, this is an innovation because in all, the, in all, in many, many features, the Transab Jewish dialects are very innovative. I mean, and and have, have taken on features from contact language. So this is probably a feature of Kurdish, because Kurdish is a, is, okay. has stress in the final position. It's not preser preserving some ancient Aramaic final stress. Oh, okay. Uh, I mean, so, so, run, so run in Kurdish. Yeah, because you see this, I mean, you know, in vocatives, for example, in Surah al you actually have penultimate stress, mm -hmm. uh, and that also is what you get in in, in, in trans South and Nina Dark. So, so, in fact, it's a kind of a, a whole kind of stress pattern is, 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 is converged with Kurdish, it seems. Good. Well, perhaps I'll leave some more que time for questions yes. tomorrow. I think I'm sorry I got so carried away with Farindul. <laughs> and uh, perhaps I'll you will tell me how to take this out. Yeah.